please welcome actor, best-selling author, and expert woodworker, Nick Offerman. Thank you. Uh, if you're on TV and you can make a table, you run the risk of being called an expert woodworker. <laughs> I'm aspiring. <laughs> I'm sincerely honored to be here in the company of such talented writers uh, and to be part of this menu. We've had erudition and eloquence, and now you get me. <laughs> uh, we're really lucky to be enjoying the incredible hospitality of the Library of Congress. Um, I've been most edified to discover that it is an actual library building. <laughs> the biggest in the world, in fact, uh, thanks to the founding vision of some of our early presidents. Uh, to quote the library's website, Jefferson's belief <laughs> in the power of knowledge and the direct link between knowledge and democracy has shaped the library's philosophy. And after reading of this link between knowledge and democracy, um, I just wanted to make sure that all the members of Congress are aware that they can access this library. <laughs> uh, that, um, Do they have that in the, in the starter pack? <laughs> My life uh, has been inescapably shaped by libraries and books and the knowledge they hold. My high school librarian, Miss Kinsella, helped me select my audition pieces for my first theater school audition at the University of Illinois in 1988. Good news, uh, I got in. <laughs> my family currently boasts three librarians and a couple of school teachers, and they are considered the most admirable family members by far. <laughs> Second only to our brother, uh, who wears an even more heroic hat as a purveyor of craft beers. <laughs> With such fealty paid to books in our family, imagine my surprise and theirs when I transitioned from reader to author, allowing me to share both with them and the readership I've been fortunate enough to cultivate, my love of the things that are the most important to me, the outdoors, working with my hands, the legendary seven delicious meats, um, <laughs> and fidelity, fidelity to my bride. The most rewarding and edifying example of these literary bounties is my very fortunate fellowship with my favorite author. Some 26 years ago, I read my first short stories by Kentucky farmer and author Wendell Berry, who was awarded the 2010 Humanities Medal by President Obama. I was rather swept away by the agrarian ethos in which all his writing is couched. Now, I was working as a theater actor and a carpenter at the time, and his themes really appealed to the laborer in me. If you're unfamiliar, his work lends a sense of nobility to the working class, especially to the farmers and the other stewards of Mother Nature's creation who do their best to provide us with the raw materials we need to live in a way that is also sustainable year in and year out, ideally forever. Agrarianism. It's sexy. <laughs> That's showbiz. 
Mr. Berry also enumerates the ways in which the so-called progress of our industrial civilization is pitted directly in opposition to the agrarians he tends to make his protagonists. And he does it all with humor and affection in a way that caused me to immediately write him a letter and ask him if I could please adapt one of his stories to the stage or the screen. Good news, he wrote me back. Bad news is, he said no. Um, but I have kept bugging him over the years, auditioning different tap dances on his porch, uh, until, good news, I was finally able to befriend him and his family and share some, some meals and some good work. And now I am delighted to stand here before you tonight and tell you that he still hasn't changed his mind. <laughs> He did, however, give me a bit of homework when I described my new book to him. He asked me, at least I, I think he asked me, although I don't recall him using any question marks, um, to compare the nature philosophy of John Muir to that of the Wisconsin agrarian Aldo Leopold. Now what he turned out to mean was, when talking about nature and conservation, to take our national gaze from the distant beauty of places like Yosemite or the Grand Canyon, the locales championed by park angel John Muir, and turn that gaze right here to the actual creation of Mother Nature in which we live every day. To steal some of that urgency from the way we think about protecting our publicly held lands with its flora and fauna and beautiful landscapes and give that urgency to our home places, our local watersheds. Aldo Leopold suggested that we employ a land ethic a notion that expands the definition of community to include not only us humans, but all the other parts of nature as well, soils, waters, plants, and animals, or what he simply called the land. In Leopold's vision, you can't care for the people without also caring for the land. Now, some more good news. I was then able to travel to gorgeous and remote national park lands and to humble farm operations in the U.S. and in England, not to mention a COVID protocol Thanksgiving with my very own family in their Illinois backyard to prepare the best report that I could muster for Wendell and also for my readers. A book eventually titled, Where the Deer and the Antelope Play, and I'm grateful for that opportunity to continue the conversation about how we are using our planet's resources for good or not, especially with regard to who is providing our food and how. I think uh, we absolutely have it in our power to get our land ethic right, but the big question remains, as always, will we? If we do, it'll be largely thanks to incredible authors like the ones featured in this festival, and the fact that I am counted among their illustrious number leads me to say it must have been a very slow year. <laughs> Thank you very much.